Hello, and thank you for joining this OncLive peer exchange titled Refining Therapeutic Strategies for Follicular Lymphoma. Despite that follicular lymphoma remains an incurable disease, outcomes are good for most patients with a median survival exceeding 12 years. However, for the subgroup of patients who have high-risk disease and develop early relapse or histologic transformation, clinical outcomes after immunochemotherapy are still poor. Today, I'm joined by a group of my colleagues who are renowned experts in the field of lymphoma research. During the next 90 minutes, we will discuss evolving research surrounding the treatment of follicular lymphoma. We'll talk about how to incorporate newly available agents into our treatment approach, and we'll highlight the studies from the 2017 ASH annual meeting. I'm Dr. Ian Flynn, and I'm the director of the Blood Cancer Research Program at the Sarah Cannon Research Institute in Nashville, Tennessee. Participating in our distinguished panel are Dr. Peter Martin, Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Hematology and Oncology at the Weill Cornell Medical Center in New York City, New York. Dr. Loretta Nastapil, Assistant Professor in the Department of Lymphoma and Myeloma in the Division of Cancer Medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Dr. Greg Nowakowski, Associate Professor of Medicine and Oncology for the Division of Hematology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And Dr. Annis Yunus, Professor and Chief of the Lymphoma Service at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City, New York. Thank you so much for joining us. Let's begin. So Greg, We've come to think of uh, frontline therapy for patients with follicular lymphoma to be chemoimmunotherapy. Yet there's some tremendous variation, I think, in outcomes for patient. Uh, can you describe perhaps how we know how these variations occur and and um, how we might tailor therapy? Absolutely. So if you look at uh, follicular lymphoma in general, there, this is a very heterogeneous disease. Even patients who with um, uh, low bulk disease, which do not require treatment, have very viable prognosis. Some of them can be observed for years, and some of them will have relatively accelerated course and will require therapy at some point. Now, in, in patients who are in need of uh, therapy, after chemoimmunotherapy, there is a um, significant heterogeneity of the outcome. About 20% of the patients or so will relapse early within the first two years, and those patients generally do much worse than patients who uh, do not. Uh, what's interesting is that a lot of data, including data from Mayo, Iowa, University of Iowa, Mayo uh, Lymphoma Spore, and uh, French group indicate that if you actually do not relapse within the first two years after chemoimmunotherapy and follicular lymphoma, your life expectancy is just like anybody else in the population. Um, a lot of those differences are driven by uh, biology of follicular lymphoma. Uh, we all know that the hallmark of the disease is the presence of translocation IgH and BCL2, which seems to be driving the disease. However, if you look at the pathology of the disease, um, apart from grading, there is a lot of variability in the presence of microenvironment cells, uh, immune microenvironment, and genetically the tumor is heterogeneous as well. There are somatic mutations and number of genes which are being described now, and all of those um, mutations and uh, heterogeneity of microenvironment are playing an important role in the differences in outcome, uh, which we see after chemoimmunotherapy. So one of the most dreaded uh, issues with uh, follicular lymphoma is perhaps the transformation to an aggressive lymphoma, and I think it's difficult in the clinic to, to know when you see patients um, who that might be. Anything that you use to, to um, maybe, maybe raise your concern about transformation, especially in that frontline setting? You're right. This is a very very uh, uh, difficult issue, and I will start from highlighting that you know the pathology, lymphoma pathology in general, tends to be difficult. So you really need to have expert pathologists looking at the biopsy uh, throughout transformation, also for the grading of follicular lymphoma. The um, some of the marks, uh, some of the clinical factors which we use looking at the patient in determination of risk of uh, 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 transformation at the presentation is LDH. A high LDH is suggestive of uh, transformation presence of B symptoms, rapidly progressive disease. Uh, the PET scan tends to be somewhat variable. Uh, it's not always uh, uh, conclusive in regards to uh, transformation. However, we do worry about the patients who have a uh, high SUV, uh, particularly if there is a uh, uh, discordance. Uh, so some of the lymph nodes are looking relatively dim, but other groups of the lymph nodes are very bright and hot on the PET scan. Uh, you, you worry that about transformation and typically would obtain a biopsy uh, to rule it out. If you look at the results uh, in Rituxan era, the risk of transformation is about 2% per year and appears to be pretty steady. Um, I think what's important is that we now found that outcome of patients with transformed lymphoma is actually quite variable as well. So if you have patients who are previously treated with multiple regimens, particularly containing anthracyclines, the outcome is actually quite poor. On the other hand, uh, patients who did not 
uh, had exposure to anthracycline before uh, uh, had do quite well with r alone. So I think that's, uh, that's encouraging because uh, in the past we used to consider most of those patients to be um, uh, in quite a difficult situation. But right now, clearly patients who are not anthracycline exposed uh, do quite well, even with transformed disease, with uh, our CHOP or similar therapy. So Peter, Greg's brought up a number of issues. Um, in clinical trials, we use um, prognostic indi indicators such as the FLIPI and, and various variations of that. Do you use these in your practice? And how does that um, change perhaps what you do? Do you, what about, we, we talked about PET scanning and maybe a way of um, figuring out um, who's at risk for transformation. But how about PET scanning after someone's had therapy? Is that useful? Sure, I think those are uh, great questions, Ian. The uh, FLIPI and uh, FLIPI2 and uh, M7 FLIPI were all prognostic scores that were uh, effectively developed really to be research tools, I think, right? And this Flippy was originally looking retrospectively at existing data. People realized that it had significant prog prognostic value, but decided that we would like to evaluate it in a, a group of patients with prospectively collected data. And so they went to the uh, Flippy 2, where they had more patients with beta 2 microglobulin available, refined that score a little bit. And then uh, later on, eventually, people said, well, we're in this next generation sequencing era. We should look at the actual genetics of the disease. And so I uh, did uh, sequencing and found seven genes had a significant uh, prognostic value and came up with the M7 Flippy. In all of these cases, I think these are just prognostic tools. They're not necessarily predictive tools. So we can report these. And I certainly add the uh, Flippy in all of my clinical notes sort of as a reminder to myself of what I'm dealing with. But I'm not necessarily sure that we need to uh, modify therapy based on the flippy score. There are certainly people with uh, low risk flippy score who don't do all that well, and there are people with high risk flippy score who do very well. So it's hard to say how we should use the flippy to impact management. It's more a, a matter of understanding where we're likely to be headed uh, when, we're uh, when we're dealing with a patient. The PET scan, I think, is a useful tool as well to assess response at the end of therapy. And certainly there have been studies that have su suggested that a, a good response to therapy defined by a, a negative PET scan at the end of therapy are associated with uh, good long-term outcomes. Whether that's just a marker of a better therapy or whether it's a marker of just a lower risk disease, I think is still unknown. So I'm not sure that we should necessarily be increasing the intensity of therapy all the time to try to get to that ne negative PET scan. Uh, but, it, but when you see negative PET scan, it's certainly encouraging.